Shalom. Welcome to the Shepherd's Light Online Church. Before the service starts, we wanted to invite you to join our chat. The chat is where you can ask questions, share verses, and connect with other viewers from around the world. Just write your first comment and choose the nickname to join. If you need prayer, click the live prayer icon and you'll be taken to a private chat where one of our team members will pray with you. The service is about to start. Don't forget to sign up so you can keep your username and profile. God bless you and enjoy the message. A greater thing to treasure I'm convinced there's nothing better Than living in your love Caught up in the wonder Of being in your presence Knowing such a friendship
the beauty of heaven all around you. Your power and your mercy, the greatness of your Standing here in your presence In a grace so relentless I am one By perfect love Wrapped within the arms of heaven In a peace that lasts forever Sinking deep In mercy see Welcome to Calvary Fellowship Haifa, the House of Hope, as we are locally known in Israel. Uh, and we are in the third chapter of 1 Samuel. Um, and just as a quick review, let's remember what was happening up to this point. 
So in the first chapter, we met Elkanah and his two wives, Chana and Panina. And Panina had children, but Chana was barren. And we remember that our story is taking place in a place called Shiloh, uh, or Shiloh. Some people call it Shiloh, some people call it Shiloh. Um, it's the place where the Israelites had set up their tabernacle for 369 years. Uh, and we read how Hannah was pouring out her heart to the Lord about her desire to have a child uh, when the high priest Eli saw her mouth moving but didn't hear any words, and he thought that she was drunk. And when she explained herself to Eli, Eli uh, we remember the beautiful response from Eli, Eli, go in peace. And the God of Israel, grant your petition, which you have asked of him. Now, I know most people come to a congregation wanting to hear the pastor or the leader has to, what they have to say about a passage. And, that, and that's always good, you know. But I, I like to encourage people uh, to, as much as possible, to at least read the passage before you come. Uh, and uh, the passage that we're going to be studying, you know, I actually recommend that, you know, when we start F Samuel, like 1 Samuel, try to find like a Sabbath where you can read all through 1 Samuel in one sitting. And when you're about to study any uh, book of the Bible, try to read it through one time one in one sitting. And it's kind of a real nice uh, exercise to do that. Not everyone does it, but it's a really kind of a neat thing to do. Um, and as, but as much as possible, at least read the passage that we're going to be studying beforehand. If possibly, if, you know, if possible, even study yourself and see what the Lord is saying to you personally before you come to the Bible study. And I, I was taught the same principle when it, when it came to doing my own Bible studies myself. There, you know, there's so many good teachers out there, and there's so many good commentaries in every book of the Bible. You know, there's numerous commentaries, with, and there's so much to learn. But I was taught before you turn to commentaries, go study yourself and see what the Lord is saying to you, and then open up your commentaries and see if what other teachers confirm what the Lord spoke to you. And, you know, obviously there will be things that you got that they didn't have and things that they got that you don't have, but it's kind of neat when you get something, when the Lord really gives you something, and then you read the commentaries and like, oh, huh, that, you know, it's like a really kind of a neat confirmation. Um, so I, you know, I want to study the passage myself, you know, to see what the Lord is saying to me. The other practice that I was taught that is, that I want to share with you is to look for one key verse from each chapter. And so you, you kind of read the chapter and, and see, is there one key verse from a chapter that really kind of like speaks to you from that chapter? And I think that if I was to look for a key verse from chapter 1 of 1 Samuel, <coughs> it would be this verse. Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition which you have asked of him. It expresses such faith that Hannah had. Hannah accepted this word from Eli the priest, as if it was the word of the Lord. And essentially, with Eli being the high priest, it really was a word from the Lord. In chapter 2, we got to hear the famous and beautiful prayer of Hannah after having her prayers answered regarding a request for a son. And then according to her vow, she brings her son to Shmuel, to Eli, her brings her son Shmuel that she got, you know, as a re answer to her prayers. Um, she brings to Eli so that he may minister in the house of the Lord. Uh, and now we get to be witness to the early life of the last of the judges of Israel and the first of the prophets. 
And we talked about this transition period that we're in between the last of the judges and the first of the prophets, a transition from being um, a theocracy to a monarchy. Um, and we read that this is the end of approximately uh, 450 years of the time of the judges. And although I do believe that the age of the prophets are past, that doesn't mean that the gift of prophecy is not available in our age. And I think it's a very important distinction to make because, and, and I believe that according to scriptures, having the gift of prophecy is not just telling the future like many people uh, think, and that's often referred to as predictive prophecy, but just Declaring the word of God is also prophecy. And so I believe many of us have the gift of prophecy. As a matter of fact, it says that we should desire, we should desire the gifts of the Lord, especially the gift of prophecy. That doesn't make us prophets like the prophets from the Old Testament. But yet we can still have the gift of prophecy. I believe I have the gift of prophecy. I don't I don't have the gift of prophecy like predicting, but I, but I, the Lord has given me dreams before. Uh, he's given me his word. And I think anytime we declare the word of God, and essentially we are, you know, pro, you know, being prophets. But one thing that I think is required when it comes to this particular gift is to hear the voice of God. Have you ever heard the voice of God? You know, it's, it's kind of a really amazing thing when you hear the voice of God. And I'm not necessarily talking about hearing an audible voice. Although on rare occasions, when I got saved, I actually heard the audible voice of God. It was the only time, and it was when I got saved. Um, and that's, I don't know if you, some of you know my testimony, but it's when I was in the teepee, and the, actually, and I was witnessing a... Um, uh, exorcism by these Native American Indians. This guy was possessed by this evil spirit. And the, and the audible voice of the Lord said to me, do you believe what you've read? And I looked around, I, I, mean, I literally heard this voice, and I knew exactly what he's talking about. He's talking about where it says in John, ask anything in the name, in my name, and it will be given to you by my Father in heaven. And, and I said, I can't do that. I'm Jewish. I can't pray in the name of Jesus. And then he said, the last thing he said to me is, you must, you must walk your faith. And so that was the only time I actually heard the voice. But many times I've, you know, you, you, um, Sometimes the Spirit of God will impress upon you. Sometimes we, we use the word quicken the Word of God, uh, quicken the written Word of God. And so you're reading your Bible and you just, you just know that God is speaking to you personally through this passage. And sometimes we just, God really impresses on us like, you might not hear a voice, but you're you like you really know God is speaking to you, and and these, so these are different levels, but these are all hearing the voice of God, um, and so the, what we you know the question that we need to ask ourselves is when you've heard the voice of God, how did you respond? And. What I want to do now is open up to chapter 3 of 1 Samuel and see how Samuel responds when he hears the voice of God. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. And we pray right now as we open up your word, Lord, that uh, you would speak into our hearts, you'd speak into our minds. We want to not only just study your word, but we want to apply your word, Lord. So I pray that you would speak to each one of us through your word tonight. Lord, let it not be me teaching, let it be your Holy Spirit teaching through me, in Yeshua's mighty name. Starting in verse 1, I'm reading 1 Samuel chapter 3. Now the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no widespread revelation. 
And it came to pass at that time, while Eli was lying down in his place, and when his eyes had begun to grow so dim that he could not see, and before the lamp of God went out in the tabernacle of the Lord where the ark of God was, and while Samuel was lying down, that the Lord called Samuel, and he answered, Here I am, Hineni. So he ran to Eli and said, Hineni, here I am, for you called me? And he said, I did not call, lie down again. And he went and lay down. Then the Lord called again, Shmuel, Samuel. So Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, Hineni, for you called me? He answered, I did not call, my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, nor was the word of the Lord yet revealed to him. And the Lord called Samuel again in the third time. So he rose and went to Eli and said, Hineni, here I am, for you did call. Then Eli perceived that the Lord had called the boy. The first thing that we, the first thing that we are told here is that the boy Samuel served the Lord before Eli. He was a priest in training. He was a disciple of Eli. You know, many of you hear me talk about discipleship. Discipleship has always been how people were trained. Even back then, as a, as a civilization in general, and the church or the believers around the world in specific, I think we've gotten away from this model. It used to be that whatever you wanted to learn, you would spend a long time living and working with the master, the mentor, or the teacher. And oftentimes it was simple as growing up with your mom or dad and learning their trade from them. We've really gotten away from this. Today, unfortunately, you can go into most churches around the world and you'll find very few disciples. Yeah, many people might believe that Yeshua is God in the flesh and believe the gospel message, but are they really disciples? For those of you who have seen the wheel illustration that I talk about a lot, uh, you'll understand the difference between a disciple and a believer. Now, if you haven't seen the wheel illustration, I recommend you um, check it out. I have it online. Uh, and, and so the navigators came up with this really neat illustration that gives a really clear explanation of the difference between being uh, believing in Jesus and being a disciple. Um, so Jesus never said, go make believers. He said, go make disciples. And I know that a lot of people use this word freely these days. You know, they're into discipleship, they do discipleship. But most, it, it's become almost like this catch word. A lot of people are using the word discipleship and they're not really doing classical discipleship. People get confused between counseling and discipleship. Those are two separate things. And so what we're talking about here is discipleship. We're talking about uh, Shmuel growing up with Eli and becoming a disciple. Uh, today, people can live their entire lives and be believers, but never become disciples if they're not taught and do what we used to say when I was in outdoor education, dirt time. There's really just no substitute for one-on-one -on -one training. Now, if you're whatever it is that you want to learn, you know, when we were talking about dirt time, it was like, you know, you can't just read, you can't learn environmental, I mean, outdoor education by just reading in a book. It's good information, but you need to get out in the dirt and you need to build your shelter and practice starting your fire. And, you know, and you need to live out there. You need to listen to the birds. It's all part of, you know, it's like you can't just read about it. The same thing with being a disciple. You can read and study all about discipleship, but it's the dirt time. It's the time of practicing living it is what really comes down to it. But as far as being in ministry and serving the Lord, there needs to be a spiritual aspect to it.
And if we remember from last chapter, Eli's sons, although born and raised around the service and the tabernacle, we read that they did not know the Lord either. And the spiritual aspect that we're speaking about here is hearing the Lord. If you're not hearing from the Lord, if you're not having an intimate relationship with him yourself, then our service is in vain. As it says in the Psalms, in Psalm 127, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It's vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he gives his beloved sleep. Unless you have an intimate relationship with the Lord, your service is in vain. We're also told at the beginning what the word of the Lord, what, that the word of the Lord was rare in those days. And the Hebrew used here is yakar. Yakar is uh, it, costly. It's precious. Apparently, it was rare in those days for people to hear from the Lord. It says people were not having visions. It seems that people, that the, between the corruption that was in the priesthood and the hardness of the heart of the people, the rebellion that was going on, God had just stopped speaking. And I think we often see this in our own lives. If, we, if God tells us to do something and we don't do it, God is going to just stop speaking. And I remember... I remember someone telling me something. It was really interesting. He said, if, you don't, if you're not hearing from the Lord, go back to the last time you heard the Lord say something to you and be obedient to that, and then he'll start speaking to you again. And this is so critical because God wants to speak to us, but he's not going to just speak if we're not listening and being obedient to what he says. So we see the scene here. Both Eli and Samuel are lying down, and it says that Eli's eyes were getting so dim that he could not see. So this could speak to his situation both physically and spiritually. As an old man, he was losing his eyesight, but he was also becoming an ineffective leader. Then it says that the lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was also falling asleep. Now, according to Exodus, the lamp of God was to be lit until sunrise, okay? And then it says, then God calls Samuel. Samuel, thinking it's Eli who called him, answers, Hineni, Hineni, here I am. Now, after the second time that God calls, it says that Samuel did not yet know the Lord. Even if someone is born and grows up in a Christian home, or home of believers, does not mean they know the Lord. Jesus said that unless a man be born again, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Every person needs to have their own born again experience. Then call, God called the third time. God almost always repeats himself when speaking with us. And he wants our attention, and if he wants our attention, he will do whatever it takes to get our attention. Samuel hears God calling, and he thinks it's Eli. Run, and he, and, it, and, it, run, and he, Eli runs to and he runs to Eli, and, it, and he says, "Hineni, here I am." Hineni. This beautiful phrase, "Hineni," occurs sixteen times in Scripture. The first time we see it is when Abraham, Abraham is responding to Isaac when they're on their way to Mount Moriah for Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. If you remember the story, Isaac knows something's up when he sees the fire in the wood, but not the lamb. And he turns to his dad, he turns to Abraham to ask him about this. And Abraham responds to Isaac with these comforting words. Hineni, I'm right here, son. 
But just a few verses later, the phrase is used again by Abraham when responding to the angel of the Lord who is about to intervene and prevent Abraham from sacrificing Isaac. Essentially, Abraham is saying, Yes, Lord, Hineni, I'm here at your service. What can I do for you? In fact, all 16 times except for one that the word, that the phrase Hineni is used, here I am, it's either used as a father son context or someone speaking to God, which essentially is a father son, father child relationship, right? Finally, this, this particular section ends where it says that Eli understood that it was the Lord who was calling Samuel. We need to learn to recognize the voice of the Lord, and we need to be sensitive, and we need to help others to learn to recognize the voice of the Lord. I think this is our job, so a responsibility as believers to, you know, people, you might have heard the phrase that everyone should have a Paul and a Timothy. Everyone should have someone that's discipling them, someone that's teaching them how to have a relationship with that Holy Spirit, how to hear from the Lord. And everyone, at some, uh, after a, some point in your walk with the Lord, you should have a Timothy. You should have someone that you're pouring into their lives and you're teaching them how to hear from the voice, how to hear the voice of the Lord. This is our responsibility as disciples of the Lord. Jesus said, go make disciples. And so this is what we do when we're making disciples. We teach them to study the word of God, to memorize the word of God, and to hear and, you know, to meditate on the word of God. And we teach people how to teach other people. And so this is how it's been passed on from generation to generation, from the time of the disciples up until today. Um, and so we need to learn to recognize the voice of the Lord. We need to be sensitive and help others learn to recognize the voice of the Lord. And our relationship with God, like any relationship, is dependent on good communication. Speaking and listening. And we usually think of prayer as asking something from God or praising God and being thankful for his blessings. And we think of Bible reading time exactly as that, just reading the Bible. But as we get to know the Lord, these two disciplines, Bible reading and praying, speaking and whatever, you know, thank you God or whatever, they kind of start melding together. And we think of prayer and Bible reading as two sides of the same coin of communication with our Father, speaking and listening. And although God can and does sometimes speak in visions and dreams, and sometimes God speaks through other people, whether it be a friend or even an enemy. Sometimes, you know, you can hear a word from the Lord even from an enemy, okay? Um, the most common way God speaks to us is through his word. It says in Hebrews uh, chapter 1, God, who at various times in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days, and we're in the last days right now, you guys. He's spoken in the last days to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. So we read in the Gospel of John we, how the Word was with God and was God, and how the Word became flesh. So anytime we open up our Bibles, and you've heard me say this again, I'll say it again, anytime we open up our Bibles and read, God is speaking to us. Sometimes the Holy Spirit, like I said, might quicken the Word, where you read something that was written thousands of years ago, to someone else and you just feel so sure that God is speaking directly to you. But whether that happens or not, every time we read the Bible, God is speaking to you. Because it says in 2 Timothy, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Let's continue in our text in verse 9. 
Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and it shall be, if he calls you, that you must say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Okay, so when Eli tells Samuel how he should respond if he hears the voice again, he uses the Hebrew word shomea, which is usually translated as hears. Ani shomea, I hear, right? But in more than 80 times in the Tanakh, Shomea is also translated as obey. It's interesting. The same word that's translated as hear, 80 times, is actually translated as obey. As an example, when God is speaking with Abraham in Genesis uh, chapter 22 in the Akedah, the, uh, he says, And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because thou hast shomea, because thou hast obeyed my voice, heard and obeyed. And again, a few chapters later in Genesis chapter 26, because that Abraham obeyed my voice, and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Both of these verses and many more use the same word, shomea. This should be our response also as we hear the Lord speaking to us. Speak, Lord, for your servant hears and is ready to obey. Obedience is key to being a child of God and a disciple. Verse 10, now the Lord came and stood and called as at other times, Shmuel, Shmuel, Samuel, Samuel. And Shmuel answered, speak for your servant hears. We read that the Lord stood or presented himself and called Samuel's name twice. This could have been a pre-incarnation appearance of Jesus. Either way, I guess he really wanted to get Samuel's attention. (laughs) Verse 11. Then the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I will do something in Israel at which both ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. And that day I will perform against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knows, because his sons made themselves vile, and he did not restrain them. And therefore I have sworn to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. (coughs) What does it mean to have your ears tingle? This word salal in Hebrew, which is translated as tingle or quiver, is only used four times in the Bible. The other three times makes it very clear that it's connected to God's judgment. As example in 2 Kings, Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Behold, I am bringing such an evil upon Jerusalem and Judah that whoever, whosoever heareth of it, both his ears shall tingle. As we spoke about it in the last chapter, this was a very serious crime that Eli's sons had committed, making the people abhor the offering of the Lord in addition to the sexual fornication that they were committing. And so God's judgment on the house of Eli would be forever. This message to Samuel regarding Eli's household was a confirmation of the word that Eli had received from, remember, the man of God in chapter 2, which may have been a warning that Eli did not take to heart or repent of. Is there ever a time that our sins will not be forgiven? In the book of Hebrews, we're told, For if we sin willfully, after that we have received after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. Continuing in verse 15, it says in our text, So Samuel lay down until morning and opened the doors of the house of the Lord, and Samuel was afraid to tell Eli the vision. Then Eli called Samuel and said, 
Shmuel, my son, he answered, Hineni, here I am. Again, this is the same word, Hineni, here I am, that we looked at earlier. <coughs> Eli calls Samuel his son here in here, showing the intimacy that's meant when this word is used, the father-son and God-son relationship. Although Eli had not done a good job raising his own sons, he was given another chance with Samuel. And it seems he did a better job raising Samuel. Oftentimes it's the case that we might not be able to speak into the lives of our, of our own children, but we can speak into the lives of other children when even our own children won't listen to us. I've found that to me the case oftentimes, like I can speak to other kids, other people's children, and they'll actually listen to me, where my own kids won't even listen to me. I don't know why that is. Maybe uh, I'll have to pray about that now. You know, everyone's got a past, right? Verse 17, and he said, what is the word that the Lord spoke to you? Please do not hide it from me. God do so to you, and more also, if you hide anything from me of all the things that I said to you. Then Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. And he said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. So Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Don to Beersheba, knew that Samuel had been established as a prophet of the Lord. Then the Lord appeared again in Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. So when Eli approached Samuel here, wanting to know what the Lord told him, it seems that he may have been expecting God's judgment because he doesn't even see, seem surprised. He's not surprised at all. He, he just says, it's the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. I guess he, you know, he just must have been expecting it. And then in verse 19, we are told that the Lord was with Samuel and let none of his words fall to the ground. This is a sign of a true prophet. Samuel was considered the last of the judges and the first of the prophets. This phrase, let none of his words fall to the ground, also reminds me of a wonderful promise from Isaiah in chapter 55 of Isaiah. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. None of God's words will fall to the ground either. Everything that God says will be accomplished. And this is an amazing thing about God. And I, I love to remind myself, and I love to remind other people, that the Bible is a book of promises. And God is a promise keeper. He always keeps his promises. You know, I like to think of myself as like dependable. You know, if I tell you I'm going to meet you somewhere, I'm going to do my best to meet you somewhere, but I'm human. I might, something might happen where I can't keep my promise. Okay, as much as I try. Okay, but God, there's never a situation where God can't keep his promise and doesn't keep his promise. Okay, and so whenever God, we read promises in the Bible, we can walk by faith because we know that word is going to be accomplished. God's word always prospers in the thing for which he sent it. And we would be well, we would do well to pay attention to the Lord's promises and respond in an appropriate manner. Samuel's first words after hearing the word, Lord's voice were he nanny. Here I am. What can I do for you? How can I serve you? In the Gospel of John, Yeshua, speaking about his sheep, the believers say three times in the beginning of the chapter that his sheep hear his voice and they follow him. We are God's sheep. And he promises us that we'll hear his voice. And the only appropriate response should be, he nanny, here I am. I'm ready to respond. Can, can you say he nanny? Can everyone say he nanny? 
that's what we want to be, you know, how we want to be. Hineni, God. So now let's continue in chapter 4. And the word of Samuel came to all Israel. Now Israel went out to battle against the Philistines and encamped beside Ebenezer. And the Philistines encamped in Aphek. Then the Philistines put themselves in battle array against Israel. And when they joined battle, Israel was defeated by the Philistines who killed about 4,000 men of the army in the fields. And when the people had come into the camp, the elders of Israel said, Why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? Let us bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord from Shiloh to us, that when it comes among us, it may save us from the hand of our enemies. So the people sent to Shiloh that they might bring from there the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of hosts, who dwells between the Cherovim. And the two sons of Eli, Chophni and Pinchas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. So that here we have the Israelites, where they were encamped next to Ebenezer. Evan, a rock. Ezer is help. Ebenezer, the rock of help. And the Philistines are camped in Aphek. Aphek is a fortress. And it's interesting that when the Israelites lost the battle, that they knew that they had been defeated by the Lord. Nevertheless, they thought that they could win against the Philistines by bringing the Ark of the Covenant with them into battle. They knew that there was some kind of connection between the Ark and being saved from the hand of their enemies. The word that's used in verse 3 when speaking of the ark, that it may save them from their enemies, is the root of the same word used for the name of Jesus, Yeshua. And then it says that the two sons of Eli came with the ark. Continuing in verse 5. And when the ark of the covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel shouted so loudly that the earth shook. Now when the Philistines heard the noise of the shout, they said, What does the sound of this great shout in the camp of the Hebrews mean? Then they understood that the ark of the Lord had come into the camp. So the Philistines were afraid, for they said, God has come into the camp. And they said, Woe to us, for such a thing has never happened before. Woe to us! Who will deliver us from the hand of these mighty gods? These are the gods who struck the Egyptians with all the plagues in the wilderness. Be strong and conduct yourselves like men, you Philistines, that you do not become servants of the Hebrews as they have been to you. Conduct yourselves like men and fight. So the Philistines fought and Israel was defeated. Every man fled to his tent. There was a very great slaughter, and there fell of Israel 30,000 foot soldiers. Also, the ark of God was captured, and the two sons of Eli, Chophni and Pinchas, died. You know, Jewish people have always been known to have a zeal for the Lord. And zeal for the Lord is a good thing, but without knowledge... It's dangerous. Paul speaks about this in the 10th chapter of Romans. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ... Yeshua, the Messiah, is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. We need to submit to the righteousness of God and not try to depend on our own righteousness. We're told by the prophet Isaiah in the 64th chapter, but we are all like an unclean thing and all of our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. And in Ephesians chapter 2, we read, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. 
not of works, lest anyone should boast. This is what religion causes. And it doesn't matter what religion it is. If it's Islam or Christianity or Judaism or Buddhism or Hindu, every religion, every religion, all religions are worse works-based. And I even say this about Christianity can be, you can turn it into a works-based religion. I don't consider my relationship with the Lord a, re, a religion. And, it's, and we want to distinguish this. And, and I have great conversations with people when they say, what religion are you, do you, are you, are you like, and people ask me this. I was getting a foot massage the other day and, uh, and the woman, I, you know, I got into this great conversation with her and she says, I don't get it. You're Jewish and you believe in Jesus. Like what religion are you? I said, I don't have a religion. I believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I have a relationship with Yeshua through the Holy Spirit, but I don't practice a religion. And so the, the, all religions are works-based, and people depend on their own actions and their religious objects to save them. And this, what was, this is what was happening with the Israelites here. They believed that just by carrying the ark into battle, that could save them. But they were missing the main ingredient, faith. Faith that comes through having a relationship with God, with the Holy Spirit through faith, through Yeshua. And when we have a relationship, we get to know someone by spending time with them. Two people listen to each other and they learn to trust one another if the person is trustworthy, right? which in God's case he is. And it's not about the outward appearance. It's about what's in the heart. So we read about a, a similar story in the book of Acts in chapter 19. Paul was doing all kinds of miracles in the name of Jesus. And there was this Jewish priest who had seven sons. You guys might remember this story. We're told that they practiced exorcisms. Apparently, the sons saw the miracles Paul was doing by calling on the name of Jesus, and they thought they could probably make some money if they also could call on the name of Jesus in their exorcisms. The only problem was that for Paul, it wasn't a religion. He had a relationship with the Lord because he spent a lot of time with him. And we read when these sons tried to exercise a demon from some man, the demon responded, Yeshua, Jesus, I know him. And Paul, I know him. But who are you? So he says, Jesus, I know. And Paul I know, but who are you? The demon went on to beat up all seven brothers. And it says that they fled the house naked and wounded. And this is exactly what happened to the Israelites in our story. They took the ark and they went into battle against the Philistines thinking that they, that's all they needed. But they were essentially just using the name of the Lord but they didn't know him. The Philistines defeated Israel and Israel fled and 30,000 soldiers were killed in the battle and the Ark of the Lord was captured. Religion is a very dangerous thing. Let's continue in verse 12 of our text. Then the man of Benjamin ran from the battle line that same day and came to Shiloh with his clothes torn and dirt on his head. Now when he came, there was Eli sitting on a seat by the wayside watching, for his heart trembled for the ark of God. And when the man came into the city and told it, all the city cried out. When Eli heard the noise of the outcry, he said, what does the sound of this tumult mean? And the man came quickly and told Eli. Eli was 98 years old and his eyes were so dim that he could not see. Now, if you remember in the first chapter, we spoke about the location 
of where the ta tabernacle might have been at Tel Shiloh. It was located on the north end of the Tel. So this man came running with the news and he entered the city. The entrance to the city was on the south side. Okay, so the people of the city heard the news that the ark had been captured and they started crying out. And Eli, being at the tabernacle on the other end of the city, he, he hears this cry, but he didn't know what it was. Finally, the guy makes him all, all the way up to the, where the tabernacle was, to the north side of Tel Shiloh, and he finds Eli sitting by the tabernacle. I'm in verse 16, it says, Then the man said to Eli, I am he who came from the battle, and I fled today from the battle line. And he said, What happened, my son? So the messenger answered and said, Israel has fled before the Philistines, and there has been a great slaughter among the people. Also, your two sons, Chophni and Pinchas, are dead, and the ark of God has been captured. Then it happened when he made mention of the ark of God that Eli fell off the seat backward by the side of the gate and his neck was broken and he died. For the man was old and heavy and he had judged Israel 40 years. So between the news that Eli's sons had been killed and that the ark of God had been captured, it was too much for Eli to handle, and he goes into shock. He falls over backwards, and he breaks his neck. Pretty kind of tough story here. Continue in verse 19. Now when his daughter-in-law, Pinchas' wife, was with child due to be delivered, and when she heard the news that the ark of God was captured and that her father-in-law and her, husband's, her husband were dead, she bowed herself and gave birth, for her labor pains came upon her, and about the time of her death, the woman who stood by her said to her, Do not fear, for you have borne a son. But she did not answer, nor did she regard it. Then she named the child Ichavod, Ichabod, saying, The glory has departed from Israel because the ark of God has been captured and because of her father-in-law and her husband. And he said, the glory has departed from Israel, for the ark of God has been captured. So the glory has departed from Israel. The ark of God has been captured. What separates God's people from the rest of the people of the world? God. If God leaves us, if his spirit departs, if he removes his glory from our midst, we're in a lot of trouble. And I think that's what's going to happen during the tribulation. Because I believe that we all who believe in Yeshua have the Holy Spirit with us. And it says that the, the, uh, before the, the man of lawlessness can be revealed, the, re, the uh, restrainer needs to be taken out of the way. And so I believe this is what's going to happen during the tribulation, that God is going to remove his glory from, from the people. Uh, it says in Exodus regarding the glory of God, And there I will meet with the children of Israel, and the tabernacle shall be sanctified by my glory. And the word sanctified here is to be holy, to be set apart. It's God's spirit that sets up us apart and makes us holy. We're not holy by any other reason other than God's Spirit living in us. That's what makes us holy. It's never been religious or having the right paraphernalia or saying the right words that can save us. It, it's ma what makes us holy is having the Holy Spirit, but rather having, having an intimacy with God. That's what makes us holy. If you're not sure if you know him or if you would like to deepen your relationship with him, you can speak with him now and you can, then you can go home and you just spend time just sitting with him. As Peter says in one of his letters, we should be even more diligent to make our call and election sure. And so I think that's really the message that we want to close with this chapter with. Make 
hour. It's not about a religion. It's not about, you know, saying your prayers and, okay, I'm a Christian because I said my prayers or because I read my Bible or because I go to church or congregation or you kiss your mezuzah and that makes you Jewish or you put on tefillin. There's nothing wrong with doing any of those things. But what, what really we need to make our call and election sure by just sitting with the Lord, spending time in his word, and listen to him and having a relationship with him. This is what being a believer is, is really all about. I mean. to be for creation eternity in your hand you spoke all life into motion my soul now to sit you to be for my failure carry the cross on my shame I sing weight upon your shoulders my soul now to sing so what can I say Your promise, my soul.